Hello, <laughs> good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm Matthew Robinson, and it's my pleasure to uh, host this evening. Um, part of my job is to scan the webinar chat. So if anyone has any questions, I can feed those through to Paul. There is also the Q&A button. Um, so I'm, I've got my eye on the Q&A button and the chat at the same time, and I can juggle between the two things and hopefully feed your questions straight through to Paul. So uh, Paul is, um, he is, uh, let me read you his a little bit of his condensed biography. Gretchen B. Kimball, Director of Orchestral Studies and Associate Professor of Music, conductor, composer, pianist, and author who has conducted conducted a phenomenal list of orchestras, including San Francisco Symphony, Netherlands Radio Chamber, Chamber Orchestra and Choir, and the Paul Taylor Dance Company. Um, Paul was a jazz pianist and has worked with uh, Dave Brubeck, Dizzy Gillespie, and many other great classical and jazz soloists like Itzhak Perlman. Um, at Stanford, where Paul currently teaches, he conducts the Stanford Symphony Orchestra, Stanford Philharmonia, Stanford Summer Symphony, and Stanford University Ragtime Ensemble, and teaches conducting. How he finds the time, I do not know. Um, Paul has written the book on Anthony Burgess, A Clockwork Counterpoint, which was the uh, first big, well-received book on Anthony Burgess and um, has is also known for his writings on Stravinsky. So I think without further ado, we should move into saying hello to Paul. Thank you, Matthew, for that <laughs> wonderful introduction. It's such a pleasure to be here. And, and I'm so delighted that this collection of Burgess's writings on music has finally made it into print. It's been a dream uh, that's to, you know, taken many years to come to fruition, and and it's just thrilling that it's that it's out there now. And I I really appreciate this chance to speak with you about it. When did you start uh, writing this book? Then was it straight after the Clockwork Counterpoint, or was it um, kind well, of a thing you were thinking of at the same time as you were uh, researching this book? Well, once the research started for for you. Well, I didn't know where the research was going to lead. I just, um, um, well, maybe I should just go back to the beginning, which is um, my my uh, interest in Burgess and his music really dates from the day that his obituary appeared in the New York Times. Um, and it included a line that says, "Every I'm paraphrasing, uh, people think of me as a novelist who wrote music on the side, who writes music on the side. I wish they'd think of me as a composer who writes novels on the side. So that was a very surprising uh, comment. And then there was a list of his compositions. This was in 1993. Um, it took three or four years to move from that comment after searching and, and anywhere I could to try to locate the music to then start to, um, I, I was put in contact with um, Burgess's widow, Liana Burgess, and, and one thing led to another and I got to start uh, having the opportunity to examine his music, his manuscripts, and- They, weren't, pub see... they weren't published at the time, were they in many- Mostly still... not. A, a, few, a few short pieces were, published by a very small publisher so it was virtually unpublished everything mm -hmm. um and so uh, once that once that effort began uh, i started also discovering you know many um essays that burgess had written about music um some of them were uh, unpublished uh, typescripts some of them were um, articles that had appeared in the Spectator, or the Independent, or the Daily Mail, all kinds of um, uh, um, pieces that he he'd written that you know were seen for a day and then they were forgotten. But I I started compiling these, and 
the the stack grew and grew and grew and and I started to look at them in in terms of um, um, areas and if you look simply at the essays that Burgess wrote about famous composers well he, he includes just about all the famous composers at one time or another um, quite a lot you know starting back with Monteverdi and going up to you know contemporary composers a contemporary as of the 1990s that is um, and and I thought well this would make really interesting reading if they were all put together organized in a way that had some logic to it chronologically by topic whatever and so so this idea of of publishing the essays took took hold back when I was writing A Clockwork Counterpoint, but I felt that book had to come out first. And, yep. and then this could follow eventually. And well, it, it took a while, but now it's out. And and uh and I, I'm, I'm I think it is a I think it is a great companion piece. And there are so many little witticisms of Burgess that kind of really made me giggle <laughs> as I went through. I mean, we could talk about, well, I think we should kind of maybe go through what the book is in in kind of order and maybe just discuss some of those um, aspects uh, chapter by chapter. Um, but you've con you've conducted quite a lot of his music over the years, haven't you? And I, they, I have. And you've some of the um, world premiere recordings of many pieces. Well, um... A few of his pieces were performed. He, he wrote a lot of orchestral music. He he loved the orchestra. He loved the sound of the full orchestra. Um, he had the sound of um, William Walton in his ear, Gustav Holst, the planets, um, Elgar for sure. He wasn't a great Von Williams fan, I think. He didn't talk too much about Von Williams, not, not with the same love that he expressed for for Holst and, and Delius and, and Elgar. But but some of his music does reflect the influence of, of Vaughn Williams as well. So he saw himself, I think, as part of this uh, world of, of British orchestral music. He wrote chamber music. He wrote keyboard music. He wrote piano music. He wrote guitar music. We'll talk more and more about, more about that. It, you know, he when when opportunities came along, he 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 grabbed them. But but there's a lot of orchestral music, most of which was performed either once or not at all. And so in a few cases, I was able to get the orchestral materials and repeat a performance. Mr. W.S., for example, the, the BBC owned those parts and I was able to rent them from the BBC and and uh, perform that work. But then there were many works that he he wrote out a, a handwritten manuscript of the score and that's all there was. So so the effort to turn that into a set of usable orchestral parts, that's a that's a big effort that takes time and money and labor. Um, so, so I, I, I went about it methodically, you might say, um, you know, it would take several months to, to get each work prepared. And, and one by one, we, we did some of those pieces, um, Marche pour une révolution, for instance, that's on, on this CD that came out. Can I make we, get it? Out it's, it's now a good time to have a little listen to one of the if your screen sharing is working. Uh, um, or, yeah. oh, are you counting on me to, to play the music? Perhaps Jazz is doing that one. I thought I Jazz thought, was go. doing that. There we go. Yeah. Let, let's listen to the first track of Mr. W.S. Ballet Suite. That's a, that's a- William Shakespeare, if anyone That's is. a great intro to <laughs> what Burgess's music sounds like. Thank you. 
Okay. Um, uh, uh, I'm not quite sure what the sound quality was like for everyone. On this end, it was not so fantastic. So if, if uh, I wouldn't want anyone to think that that's the actual sound quality of the recording. <laughs> yeah, three things for me. Number one, um, the, the compression that you get from streaming Spotify and then out through Zoom just made everything sound a bit like this. So yeah, uh, yeah. people wouldn't have been able to hear exactly the, the real sound of it. But you did get a feel for for those influences. I, I certainly did. Jumping out near the beginning there was Walton. The orchestration similar, the little quirky little bits of rhythm like in Belshazzar's Feast. Yep. The, um, the long sustained melody, just a little hint of Elgar in the middle, something quintessentially English. And uh, also a bit of Britain, because I know that this was, I don't know what year this was written, but it being William Shakespeare, that kind of linked to Elizabethan and then Britain's Gloriana opera, just a little kind of hint of that came mm -hmm. through for me. Mm -hmm. Not sure what you... Yeah, the, the, the genesis of this piece is complicated. Um, Burgess was invited in 1968 to write the screenplay for a big Warner Brothers film about Shakespeare's love life. And um, and he, he wrote the screenplay and then he wrote the music for the film too, uninvited. He, he, he scored, or at least he came up with, with themes and, and tunes and songs for this, for this film. And then Warner Brothers decided that a film about Shakespeare in Love would never be a hit. And so they pulled the plug on the- Will they on, find Joseph Fiennes? <laughs> exactly. So uh, yeah, the joke was on them. But um, Burgess's film never, never was made. But he'd written the music, and then he thought, well, let me, let me do something with all this music. So he turned it into a Shakespeare ballet called Mr. W. S. And he, he put that score together. The score is un, not dated, and it's, it's that's very unusual for him. Burgess almost always dated his scores quite precisely. This one isn't dated, but it, it probably it was done around 1970, it, the mid to late 1970s, whether it was 1974 or 1979, it, it's not, not entirely clear, but it was, it was done around that time. And we actually did a production of it in France in 2020. 14, I think it was, and we actually did the, did it with orchestra and with the ballet production in in Angers, France. So it's so it's been done once as a ballet, um, and it's and it's been performed. I've performed it a bunch of times in the, in the U.S. It was done once or twice in England. It hasn't been played a lot. It's very. I think it's one of his best pieces. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, um, I I I um, I hope. Our listeners will go on Spotify themselves or, or the CD. Naxos the CD streaming and, and hear this recording and hear your new recording. Maybe can I flip the can I flip, can the, flip questions, the questions, Matthew, and give there you a were... chance to discuss this? Oh, where did you get that? Um actually there was a little theme bum, bum, bada, that just kind of crept in that was from Definitely, I think it's the second quartet, the last movement. Um, Burgess did a lot of self-borrowing. Um, yeah, a little he composed, bit of recycling. He composed over 200 works, but in actuality, a, a number of those works repeat music from other works. The guitar quartet is, is the second guitar quartet is one of those pieces that almost entirely quotes another work. So... <laughs> Uh, and you know the the speed at which he wrote was also dazzling. Um, uh, the first guitar quartet, the, the, these pieces were mostly written for the Aigetta Quartet in Monte Carlo, where Burgess was living. He met one of the guitarists. The guitarist mentioned, "Oh, I have a guitar quartet." Burgess said, "Oh, I compose. Would you like me to write a piece for you?" And he said, "Sure." And four days later, Burgess has handed him the score of the first guitar quartet. I mean. It was amazing, but partly the reason he could compose so fast is sometimes he was simply 
recycling music from other pieces. Well, the so. book uh, has almost the, the most written about guitar quartets of any book that I've ever read. <laughs> it's not the most written about subject, the guitar quartet. So to open it and find almost um, a full little mini chapter about a guitar quartet concerto is unusual. But now, um, when you say the book, you're, we're talking about the devil the prefers, prefers Mozart. Indeed. Yeah, be because Bur Burgess wrote a lot about the, his guitar music, which was all as a result of this association with the I Get the Quartet, and then the the magazine Classical Guitar also commissioned him to write a couple of pieces on the guitar. So it it, it turns out that he wrote more about his guitar music than almost any other any of his other compositions. It was his first foray into guitar when he wrote the accompaniment for the harmonica player that was his friend. Or had he oh. already done a little? John dip. Sebastian, yeah. John Sebastian, who's the the harmonica virtuoso, who's the father of John Sebastian of the Love and Spoonful, that was a rock group that <laughs> people of a certain right age, now. like mine, remember. Um, anyway, um, yeah, John Sebastian uh, liked to go on tour. He toured a lot, and... Touring with a piano has difficulties. Not every venue has a piano or the pianos that they do have don't always sound good or they're not in tune. So he thought his life would be much uh, happier if he could tour with a guitar instead of a piano. So um, he asked Burgess if he could write him a few pieces and he did. And, and that's an interesting part of the research for this book because for many years, those pieces were believed lost, or at least they were believed by me to have been lost. And I finally was able to locate them um, in, in researching this. And th there was an unpublished essay about John Sebastian, a kind of memoriam to John Sebastian. I, I didn't understand what that was written for either, but, but there was a book written by a friend of John Sebastian to memorialize him. And, and he had commissioned Burgess to write this essay. There is a grand total of one copy of this book. And it exists- Is it behind you on that shelf? It exists in, uh, no, it's not, it's not behind. No, yeah, actually everything here these are these are all Burgess books. <laughs> that whole bookcase. <laughs> um, that's one of the things. If you take on researching Anthony Burgess, you've got a lot of reading ahead of you. Um, but uh, we we were able to locate. I was able to locate the um, this one copy of the of the book which exists. At, I think it's Pittsburgh State College in Kansas. A rather random place for the one copy of this book to exist. And the um, and the pieces that Burgess composed for John Sebastian are in another archive in Pennsylvania. And they have different titles than the titles that he always said they had. But now, now we have the music. They, those pieces can finally be played. So uh, yes, well, I, I know whether that was quite a few the first guitarists time, who'd like to get their hands on them. Yeah, yeah, and whether that was the very first writing he did for the guitar, I don't think it was the very first, but it was. Those pieces were written around 1972 or so, and th that was on the earlier side of his involvement with the guitar. That's great. He, yeah, he played that. it a little bit himself. He he writes, you know, he writes about it in. Uh, he, he says he pretend, of battlements. pretend flamenco or something that he can. That's right. Strum a little bit of. <laughs> and, and he tried to get Liana to to learn how to play the guitar. You know, music was such a part of his life, and I think he he wanted to share that with Liana, and and so he he implored her to take 
guitar lessons, and that's how he met the members of the I Get the Quartet. He went, you know, he went to the music academy in Monaco and said, "Is there somebody who can teach my wife to play the guitar?" I, I don't think she stuck with it very long. <laughs> but he could play a saraband at the speed. Wait, no, is it a jig at the speed of a saraband? Something like that. Yeah. <laughs> um, if we if we go to the first part of the devil prefers Mozart, which is musical musings. We've been musing on music currently, but um, we've already had the piece that was based on William Shakespeare. And there's a little chapter in musical musings that uh, talks about the screw your courage to the sticking place. Mm, right. But if you want to delve yeah. deep into that. Yeah, Burgess had certain certain ideas that he stuck with, and one of them that is that Lady Macbeth, um, when she's trying to convince um, Macbeth to you know get his courage up and and start start murdering the the people who are in his way to the throne, she says, "Screw your courage to the sticking place," and Burgess was a hundred percent convinced that this referred to the tuning of a lute. And that without uh, music, this this uh, musical analogy, this 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 line doesn't make any sense. But it, it could mean other things. It could mean the the stretching of a crossbow, or or more pro probably, at least it seems to me, the sticking place had to do with the butchering of an animal. And, and there was a book published 40 years before Shakespeare wrote Macbeth on animal husbandry, in which it says, in order to effectively butcher a certain animal, you must insert the knife to the sticking place. <laughs> uh, so I don't know what Shakespeare really meant. I don't know if he was referring to animal husbandry or the tuning of a lute, but I, I don't think it's quite as black and white as as uh, as hmm. our our friend makes it out to be. And uh, I don't know if I have the little quote, but um, Burgess thinks that perhaps John Dowland and Shakespeare knew each other, but in a rather undignified way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I will let you find that quote. I don't I don't oh, I don't quite remember that one, but but um yeah, well, you know, Burgess loved to um muse upon Shakespeare's love life, wrote a whole novel about it, nothing nothing like the sun. And um okay, I have the quote. Okay. This is one, go this is one yes. big igloo. Where, where, uh, where is it? Where is it? What page? A 50, Guitar and I. Okay. And um, if I go from... Because he's talking about Hector Berlioz, who played the guitar, but not being an, um, a guitarist necessarily himself. Uh, how orchestral composers or people who don't play guitar writing for guitar, I think it's more that. Um, and the hexachord hell of trying to write chords for it. Uh, and then he says, by the way, did Shakespeare play it? Meaning the lute. Oh, Screw yeah. your courage to the stick it's in Macbeth. Sounds to me very much like the metaphor of a lutenist. Of course, he was probably friendly with John Dowland and watch him when he was screwing. <laughs> That's the one, <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> The, so I, mean, I don't is, know if there's any evidence he ever met John Dowland, but yeah, this is this is this is one of those essays from classical guitar, 1983. Oh, fantastic! So, did uh, you have to get in touch with uh, Colin Cooper? Uh, how I, did you know that they even existed? Oh, these these uh, articles, the classical guitar ones. It's such like a niche little. I just just scholarly tenacity, I suppose. <laughs> and yes, and this is this is the article where it's pointed out that the piece that Burgess always calls Faunal Noon, which mm -hmm. 
always seem to be, um, you know, a reference to Debussy's Afternoon of a Fawn <laughs> is really titled Panique, P-A-N-I-Q-U-E. Huh. Do you see that? It's the note. Panique. What does panique? Panic. 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 And, uh, and, and now that I have access to the score, I see that it has nothing to do with Debussy and the afternoon will fall. Not at all. <laughs> so, so that was a kind of a, of a, of, of a, you know, misdirection that has finally, now we know, we know the truth about it. Great. You, you, you mentioned briefly the Daily Mail. Yeah. Didn't, didn't miss that. Because he writes about punk yeah. for the Daily Mail. And it's very scathing of punk. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he doesn't see it as a legitimate art form. Well, it, he, he was very defensive when it came to punk. And he wrote about it quite a lot. Uh, and it's because there was a very uh, well-known American columnist named William Sapphire, who used to write, he, he became very well known for a column called On Language in the New York Times, which he wrote for a long time. But this wasn't a, this is, wasn't one of those On Language essays. It was just a, an op-ed piece he wrote in the New York Times. I, I quote it in the book, in the, um, in the, um, in the commentary section at the back. In fact, it, it cost quite a lot of money, I have to I have to share with you <laughs> to get the rights to be able to include that quote in the book. Uh, but I really wanted that quote to be included. So I gladly paid the fee. Um, and Which page that, is that one on? Uh, let, let's see. Uh, I'll find it in a second. Um, uh, it is... Commentary 48. 486, 87. Punk. So is it, it is. the father of punk is England's Anthony Burgess? Here it is, June 1977. Uh, William Sapphire writes in the New York Times, the godfather of punk is England's Anthony Burgess, the author of A Clockwork Orange, a novel and movie of a few years ago that satirized our love of violence by portraying a future society run by goons. Their violent looking clothes and makeup are the guiding spirit of punk. Horror show was the goon's favorite adjective, meaning terrific. Most of us thought the irony lay in equating horror with good, but author Burgess, who was also an eminent linguist, had something deeper in mind. Horror show was a play on horror show, the expression for good in the Soviet Union. Only a word play, perhaps, but the brief and meteoric emergence of punk is rooted in a satiric reminder of the potential for brutality that lurks in every one of us. Well, <laughs> Burgess was horrified by this, um, 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 I'm, ju I'm just looking at some of the um, uh, comments in the chat. We'll get to those in a moment. But uh, Burgess was, was really uh, offended by this uh, attribution as being the godfather of punk. So, so shortly after that, he started writing in the Daily Mail and wherever he could, articles refuting his... Uh, his role as the godfather of punk. And that's why there are articles that he wrote about sex, pist sex pistols and Boy George. And, and some of those articles were quite prescient and some of them were quite off the mark, but he, he had a lot to say about it. I wonder if it's because he wanted to put a little bit of distance between the Clockwork Orange and himself as a composer. Uh, I, 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 Himself as an author, I mean, author. Uh, um, absolutely. The, I mean, the phrase you know, a once... clockwork orange, a novel I have never particularly cared for, <laughs> might surprise some people who only know him for writing that. Yeah, well, we we could we could easily, you know, spend the rest of this discussion on a clockwork orange, and and that's of course how Burgess is best known. But I think he 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 was dismayed by the fact that that's how he was known, and for so many people, that's all he was known for. So, so I he think that... to say, I do not think it has anything to do with punk. But then, also 
then connects it back to the Elizabethan again. And he says, my own book suggests a kind of expensive elegance, rather Elizabethan, with its built up shoulders and cod pieces. So he's yep. always trying to think of a, 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 an, a an expressive um, aesthetic that he's in, that's something different to what was happening in the modern and definitely linked him back to people that he respected, like Shakespeare and the, the art that they created. Um, well, there's also the Teddy Boys um, of the 50s and the mods and rockers, and you know they they would dress in the sort of mock Elizabethan outfits sometimes. So there there's also a, a tie in to that as well, but. The Elizabethan era was, uh, you know, something that never ceased to fascinate Burgess. One of his last books about the death of Christopher Marlowe, right? So, and I forget, three or four of his books are on Shakespeare. So, and mm -hmm. the music we just heard, the Mr. W.S. Um, there's a question in the chat, Paul, and it's from Ian. Yeah. Hello, Ian. How are you doing? It's been a while since I saw you. Um, Ian would be interested to hear how Burgess's music intersects with or departs from traditional classical conventions. Okay, fantastic question. Thank you, Ian. Um, so, so I, I've often been asked, you know, what's Burgess's music like? Well, you can only answer that question by going through a whole series of types of music that Burgess wrote in. So, so there is a kind of large portion of his music is classical and, and as we discussed before, has a roots in English music of the late 19th, early 20th century. Burgess also was um, very fond of chordal harmonies. He liked to he liked to stack chords based on the fourth instead of based on the third. He and mentions that when talking about the guitar and its tuning. Yes. It might have been one of Ex the draw. Exactly, that might be one of the things that drew him to the guitar. So, so the um, the um, the composer we associate with that kind of harmony quite often is Paul Hindemith. So, so there's a, there's a kind of harmonic link between Burgess's music and Paul Hindemith's music. In, in the, in the, the New Grove, there's a, I was asked to, to write a, an art, the article on Burgess, and I came up with the, uh, this little snappy um, quote that Burgess's music is like a hybrid of Holst and Hindemith. Because I like alliteration, and but it, I think it's also true. It 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 combines the English and the Hindemithian fourth. So that's one side. Burgess loved popular music, so there's there are large amounts of his music that are based on in British music hall, English music hall. Um, there's a whole James Joyce operetta called Blooms of 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 Dublin. Which is um, has a lot of English musical type music in it. Um, he was a somewhat of a jazz pianist, so there are jazz influences that turn up in his music. Um, what Do you think that missing? came from his father playing as a pub pianist? Sure, sure, absolutely. Um, you know, his father played for the silent films, and Burgess did some of that himself. Um, so, so there's that influence. Um, uh, there are pieces that are kind of um, uh, based on Beethoven, the sort of parodies of Beethoven's music, parodies of Bach's music. But Burgess wrote his own well-tempered clavier, except he called it the bad, the bad-tempered electric. electronic keyboard. But it was a, also a set of 24 preludes and fugues written in record time. He wrote it in about a month at the end of 1985 to make sure that he got it in in just in time to celebrate the Bach tercentenary that year, the 300th anniversary of Bach's birth. So, so there's a, there's some pieces that are kind of parodies of Handel. Um, 
one one thing that Burgess didn't do very much was adhere to the twelve tone um, system, and of course, his years writing were exactly the time when many many composers were were writing twelve tone music. Burgess Burgess dabbled in it a very little bit, but not much. He wasn't he wasn't a huge fan of Arnold Schoenberg, more more Stravinsky when it came to modernist composers, a little bit of Bartok influence. There's a question in the Q&A, but I've got one. I'm going to, it must be a host's prerogative to sneak in first. Um, there, in some of the chapters of um, Devil Prefers Mozart, he talks about his admiration of Debussy. And in a similar breath to jazz and how Debussy would write chords and then add uh, added chords about it, kind of similar composing method to how whole, whole tone scales work. Mm -hmm. um, but then in another breath, in another article, derides jazz. <laughs> yes, he really does. That's shocking. That was shocking to me to find that. that jazz you is have it there? also inhuman uh, in that it exploits the animal rhythms of the blood and leaves out the cerebral cortex. <laughs> there, there's another there's another quote about jazz that's that's also quite scathing um let's see if i can find it quickly um the piano forte in jazz is a forte doesn't have the piano as a dynamic option yeah i don't i don't want to take up the time of this um of this chat to hunt for it but there's a there's another there's another comment on jazz that is, um, it's in one of those early, it's in one of the early, um, the early that was in the listener. I think it's, I think it's, um, oh, let's try it. 359. Let me see if I can quickly find it here. Uh, Yeah, here it is. Um, he says, "What?" And this is this was written in 1964. What I find hard to understand is why so many people are able to listen to jazz without themselves ever having played it. I once played jazz as well as pop, and my interest in listening to the quote great performers was primarily technical. It sprang out of a preoccupation with the possibilities of my own instrument, piano, in an essentially limited medium. Jazz is not expressive, nor is it concerned, unless it is played by Brubeck, who I am told is no jazz man, with extending its melodic, rhythmical, and or harmonic scope. It is narcissistic and, far from rejoicing in true improvisation, it will slyly hoard effective tropes and bring them out again and again. If Jazz 625, well, program he's reviewing, has done nothing else, it has convinced me of the ultimate auditory aridity of a medium whose true appeal is to the effector organs. <laughs> Ouch! <laughs> That's how you tear someone down in an yeah, article. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Remarkable. Remarkable. We have a question here from Michael Schmidt about Roman Catholic music. Ah, oh, great. You can see that. And uh, and Burgess's interest in that. So Burgess was, as Michael points out, very preoccupied or or alludes. Uh, Burgess was very preoccupied with religion and Roman Catholicism in his novels and his writings. Um, it doesn't come into play too much in his music. I guess one could point to a few compositions in which um, uh, chant uh, is is included uh maybe in the he wrote music for a tv series called ad uh, in fact it's very hard to get but the, here it is on video cassettes vhs fantastic yeah if you if you get the newer the newer DVD version, 
uh, it leaves it leaves part of it out. So if you want the complete thing, you you have to go to the old VHS version. Anyway, Burgess was asked to write the screenplay for this, and once again, he he scored it. He wrote the music, and and nobody had asked for the music, and and they they credit him as as having composed some of the music for it. I've watched and listened to that entire uh, series, which is something like uh, ten hour, nine hours long. I never heard a note of his music in it. I, I, I don't know quite. Maybe, maybe they just thought if they gave him a credit, he'd be satisfied with that. I, I don't, I don't really know. And it, it takes a long time to listen to it. <laughs> That carefully to listen for his his music. <laughs> anyway, I in that in the music he wrote for AD, which is not included in that series, but doesn't there are there is um, you know written out manuscript. There are some chants that you know I think Thai Catholicism, Roman Catholicism, Catholicism, and and Gregorian chant. He incorporates a little bit in his music, but it, it's it's not a big influence um, musically. At least at least I haven't I haven't found any any deeper connection. Fantastic! Just written in the chat that now is the time for questions, so that we can fit some in before we run out. Um, anyone has any more? Were there any myths that you had to bust while you were there researching? There was a very important myth that was is busted in this book, um, and that's the myth of the beautiful Belle Burgess. So Burgess was very keen on showing a genetic um, heritage when it came to music. His father did play piano in the pubs and for silent film, but that wasn't quite good enough for for Anthony Burgess. He he wanted to show heritage from his mother's side as well, and so he propagated the myth of beautiful Belle Burgess, and and in virtually every book about Burgess, including my own A Clockwork Counterpoint, although I I do mention it in a slightly quizzical way he always said his mother sang and danced in in music halls but um there's a a, a scholar and archivist simon johnson who looked into this question and um and discovered that it, it, it's simply not true and and it's it's quite fascinating it's um it's in the notes. Let me see if I can find it here. It's, um, I think it's on page, yeah, it's on page 512 in the commentary section. It's, um, it's the notes on a chapter called The Making of a Writer, in which, once again, Burgess talks about his mother as a soubrette known as the beautiful Belle Burgess. But Simon Johnson tells us that this was a fictionalized version of his mother. There was a Lancashire-born prima donna who also had the same name, Elizabeth Burgess. And this is what Simon Johnson writes. During his youth, Burgess encountered his mother's unrelated namesake in the local Manchester press during the 1920s and early 1930s and was much taken by her musical career with the Carl Rosa Opera Company. This namesake was one Elizabeth Burgess, who hailed from the town of Ashton under Lyne, some six miles to the east of Manchester. As a touring member of London's Carl Rosa Opera Company, this Lizzie Burgess became one of England's most prominent operatic singers around the turn of the century. The Carl Rosa regularly toured the province, provinces, and Lizzie Burgess often performed in Manchester. Burgess was certainly aware of its existence, stating in, in his autobiography that the Holy Name Church itself has theatrical associations. The Carl Rosa Opera Company would sing a flamboyant high mass with orchestral accompaniment. By the time Burgess reached his teens, the soprano Lizzie Burgess 
had retired from her career as a performer, but maintained, re, but remained well regarded locally as a teacher of singing and voice production on behalf of the Carl Rosa. So, so the name was already there, and she was a well known singer. So Burgess just slyly started to uh, mix the two. His his pedigree mother, by association. Yes, and and. <laughs> He's fooled us all for years and years and years, but now we know that it's that's made up. <laughs> so yes, that's that's uh, that's one myth that is busted. Simon Please. Johnson says, "Hi, hello, Simon. Thank you so much for your wonderful research." Um, <laughs> we have another Q and A chat. Uh, John Wilkinson asks, "Please, can you explain the Napoleon Symphony device, which I found hard to follow?" The Napoleon Symphony is a complicated situation. This is where Burgess this was, this grew out of Clockwork Orange. So uh, um, Stanley Kubrick was, was planning to make a movie of Napoleon. And, and right before his movie was about to start shooting, someone else Produ uh, uh, released a Napoleon film starring Rod Steiger as Napoleon it was a big flop, and so so um, Kubrick's uh, backers pulled out. Kubrick needed a new uh, a new idea for a film. Uh, one of his friends handed him a Clockwork Orange. He read it in one sitting and said, "Okay, that's the book." And that's how Clockwork Orange came to be because of the failure of Napoleon's the Napoleon film to be made. But as soon as Clockwork Orange was done, Kubrick said to Burgess, can you, can you write a screenplay for a Napoleon film? I want to get back to that now. So Burgess's habit was, if asked to write a screenplay, he liked to write a novel first and then convert that into a screenplay. So he, he got the idea of writing Napoleon Symphony based on the structure of Beethoven's Eroica Symphony which is kind of outlandish idea. So exactly what does that mean? I think this is John Wilkinson's question. What does it mean to base Napoleon Symphony on the structure of the Eroica? Well, I, I grappled with that for quite a long time. And, and I finally uh, came to the conclusion that it was based more or less on the duration of each movement and the character of each movement. And I can't really explain it in very well. So he doesn't the remaining minute. As a quick explanation of sonata form. He doesn't base the first chapter or third of the book on uh, like an A section and a B section, and then the first bit comes back again, but it's slightly different. Well, that uh, that's what happens in a Clockwork Orange. The novel A Clockwork Orange is written in sonata form, uh -huh. and and that's all explained in in you know in this book, A Clockwork Counterpoint. But, mm -hmm. but for, for John's question, I would refer him to chapter 16 of that book, Bonaparte con Brio. And that's, that's the best answer I can come up with for the Napoleon Symphony device. Um, so I hope that suffices. Uh, Ian Carrington asks, if Burgess never owned or used a piano, what do you think would be his instrument of choice? Well, he did. He did own a piano. In fact, he 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 owned um, um, Josephine. Um, what's her name? Um, uh, you know who I mean. The tambourine playing lady. That was something else. <laughs> yes, uh, yes. He owned her her piano. Um, what do you think would be his his um, uh, his instrument of choice? Um, well, you know, the very uh, quiet guitar. I think. <laughs> I, I don't I don't see him playing a brass instrument very very much, and he definitely d wasn't a string player. He didn't he, he he didn't consider himself a string player at all. I think Burgess would, you know, want an instrument that could imitate an orchestra because he liked big sound. So maybe the organ, or I don't know maybe the harp. That's kind of hard to imagine Burgess playing the harp, but maybe there are only a few instruments that can, you know, play 
chords and melodies all at the same time. I think he would want something like that. Um, could we perhaps finish with a tiny bit of Burgess's music? If uh, I share a little bit from the album. That'd be a great way to end. It's a lovely way to end. So I'm on share sound. And we don't necessarily have to go from the beginning of this movement. We've got four minutes. And with that, big round of applause uh, from me to Paul. Thank and, you so and, much. And back to you, Matthew, for that wonderful <laughs> playing in the in the quartet. I hope uh, I hope that our listeners will go out and get a copy of the complete guitar quartet, the first recording of the 
of the court, three quartets and all of the arrangements for guitar quartets by Anthony Burgess. And back at you for this fantastic book, which really showcases uh, Burgess's uh, fascinating writing on music. So thank you. Uh, Jazz, hello. Thank you guys both so much. Um, this past hour has been so fun. I am obsessed with the Josephine Baker piano fact. I like want to know so much more about that story, but we're out of time. Um, so thank you guys for being here and thanks for your questions. Um, I've put the link in the chat for you. So please do go buy and copy. Um, you'll get your two pounds off. Uh, there's a, a discount code for you there in the chat and it'll also come as an email. So um, check your inbox and get in touch with me if you have any problems getting hold of a copy of the book. Uh, but that's it, really. I think. Um... And, and, and thanks to Carcanet for for bringing out this collection, which which um, which wound up, I think, twice the length that I was told was the maximum. So so for for agreeing to print five hundred seventy seven pages of Burgess's writings on music, thank you, thank you, thank you. A big book, so therefore a bargain when you buy it <laughs> for all your friends, which you should. Um, please join us again next time. We're launching a book um, online at the end of the month, Ollie Hazard's next poetry collection. But that's in the chat for you um, and you should sign up for our newsletter so you don't miss anything. Uh, but that's everything. So yeah, congratulations, Paul. And um, thank you both for a lovely evening and goodbye. <laughs>